Luca Joe here. Today we're going to take a look at this game, Freezing Inferno, USSR versus Finland 1939 to 1940. This is a game designed by Vukashin Nishavich and to be published through a Kickstarter campaign by Princeps Games. This is a two-player strategic game of the Winter War, the conflict between Finland and the Soviet Union. In order to win, the Soviets must control two of the three Finnish key cities, while also controlling at least five of their seven home cities. And if the Soviets do not achieve this by the end of the eighth round, the Finnish player wins. The game lasts eight rounds, and in each round, the Soviets and the Finns take their own turn. The Soviet player always goes first. Let's take a look at the game board. It shows Finland and surrounding countries with borders that date from 1939. The board is divided into hexes and there are several types of hexes. We see clear hexes, forests, hills, mountains, lakes, sea and frozen sea hexes. In the hexes we see also cities, forts, airfields and roads. Terrain of course has an effect on movement and combat. Borders of the countries are denoted by red lines and at the beginning of the game no player can place a unit on any hex through which a border passes. Each side has their home cities, and these bring a certain number of military capacity. And this is indicated by the number which you see next to the city and the total of all military capacity cities that are under a player's control is the national military capacity. And we keep track of this on the national military capacity chart. At the beginning of the game, the Soviets have a capacity of 29 and the Finns 28. Now the national military capacity changes when a side captures enemy cities and also when it loses friendly cities. So let's say that in a particular combat situation, the Soviet tanks attacked this Finnish infantry unit, which was in a city with a national military capacity of two and the Finns retreated and the Soviets managed to capture the city. The Finns have to deduct the value in military capacity that the city had because they lost it. So they have to subtract two. So now their military capacity goes down to 26. Now the Soviets only add one point of military capacity every time they capture an enemy city. So now their military capacity is 30. Let's say that later during the game, the Finnish forces push the Soviets out of that city and occupy it once again. In that case, the Finns regain their two points of military capacity the Soviets, they only lost the one point of military capacity that they had gained, so their military capacity returns to 29. In this game, three of the Finnish cities, Helsinki, Oulu, and Petsamo, represent key cities, and these are marked with an asterisk. For the Soviets to win, they must capture two of these three key cities. There's also home cities, and the Soviets must also control five of their seven home cities to win. And again, if this is not achieved by the end of the eighth round, the Finns win. Terrain in this game has an impact on movement. Just to give you an idea, in this game, a clear hex costs three movement points to enter. Forest hex, four, hills, five, and mountains, six. Terrain also modifies the attack, giving advantages in certain instances to attacking units and in other instances to defending units. There are seven types of units. 
there's infantry, artillery, tank, fighters, bombers, anti-aircraft guns, and headquarter units. Let's take a look at what the numbers on a sample infantry counter are about. Here we see that infantry has an attack value of 2, a defense value of 3, and 11 movement points. Here we see a typical artillery unit, and it has an attack value of 4, a defense value of 1, 9 movement points, and a range of 4 hexes, meaning that it can project its attack value up to 4 hexes away. So we've seen the victory conditions and it is clear that the Soviets have the burden of the attack. They have to capture two of these Finnish key cities and hold on to five of their seven cities. At the beginning of the game, each of the sides has nine infantry units with a strength of five counters each. However, as you will see, the Finns have an advantage in that their infantry has some special abilities and with technological improvements, they are even deadlier. The Soviets have an advantage in tank units four to two. Artillery wise, both sides start with three units, but the Soviets have an advantage in the air, three fighter and two bomber units compared to two fighter and one bomber unit or the Finns. Both sides have equal number of headquarters and anti-aircraft units. You can see that infantry in this game for both sides has an attack value of 2, that number in red, and a defense value of 3, with 11 movement points. Now, Finnish infantry in this game has a special ability. If a Finnish infantry unit wipes out a Soviet tank unit, it captures the tank counters that it eliminated. And we signify this by substituting the Soviet tank counters by Finnish ones. Now that's not all. There's other abilities that Finnish infantry can gain if you're using module two or special rule two, which has to do with technological tactical improvements. For example, the Finns could develop multi-tactics and these were uh, tactics used by the Finns to take advantage of Soviet forces that were strung along a road. They would find a way to divide them and defeat them in detail with inferior numbers. Now, the way that's reflected in the game is that Finnish infantry can ignore enemy zones of control. So with multi-tactics, we could have this Finnish infantry unit move adjacent to the top infantry unit of the Soviets, ignore its zone of control, and continue moving adjacent now to the Soviet artillery and engage it in combat. Another technology that impacts Finnish infantry that can be developed is the Molotov cocktail. And this gives the Finns a plus one attack modifier when Finnish infantry attacks a Soviet tank. Now in this example, a Finnish infantry unit with a strength of four moves adjacent to this Soviet tank unit with a strength of three and declares that it will be attacking the Soviet unit. So now we determine the total attack value of the Finnish infantry unit and the total defense value of the Soviet tank unit. We start with the attack value of the Finnish infantry, which is two, plus the strength of the unit, which is four counters, for a total attack value of six. For the Soviet tank, we start with its defense value of four, and we add the number of strength counters that the unit has, which is three for a total defense value of seven. So it's a total attack value of six versus a total defense value of seven. So now we locate the appropriate column on the ground to ground and air to air combat results table. This is of course a ground to ground attack. 
and we see that brown colored column there, 81 to 99%. That's where this combat will be resolved. And you see the ratio there, six to seven, which is the number of total attack and defense of value that we just calculated. So we will be rolling a die and obtaining a result there. But before we do, we have to determine the applicable attack modifiers. And notice that the defending Soviet tanks are in forest. Here we see the attack modifiers that have to do with terrain. And this is the table that we consult when the defenders are in forest, hills, or mountains. And you see that when the defender is a tank and it is attacked by an infantry unit, there is a plus one modifier. And in that case, that favors the attacking Finns. And in this example, Finnish infantry has developed the Molotov cocktail improvement. So there is another plus one modifier when Finnish infantry is attacking a Soviet tank unit. Now the game includes various options in terms of the die or dice you want to use. You have to use a D8, that is a die that uh, provides a result one in eight, and you have a standard D8, which is included. This one has eight sides and each side has a different number. But there's also a custom dice with 20 sides that provides a result from one to eight. And in this one, you have a 10% chance to roll a one, two, seven or eight. There's another 20 sided die, which has a 5% chance to roll a 1 or an 8, 10% to get a 2 or a 7, and 15% to get any other result. So you have to choose which die you're going to use. Let's say that we're going to use this uh, die. And now we would roll on the 6 to 7 column, which we see there. And uh, let's roll to see what the result of the combat is. And the roll is a three, but we apply the plus two. That is the plus one for the terrain where the tanks are, which is forest, and the plus one for the Finnish multi-tactics. So we would have a final result of five, and that is, on the attacking side, nothing but the defender suffers a no offensive next turn result. So now we place this marker no offense next turn on these Soviet tank units. And what this means is that those Soviet tank units cannot play at all during the next turn. They cannot move, they cannot attack. They just sit there for one turn. And the Finns can also develop the White Death Sniper Advancement. And this gives them a plus one modifier when Finnish infantry is attacking Soviet infantry. Now, these are technology improvements that the Finns can obtain by spending military capacity and then rolling to see if they are developed or not. For the Soviets, they also have their unique set of technology improvements. They have the B4 203mm howitzer, and this increases the range of Soviet artillery by one hex. They have the KV-2 tank, and this provides a minus one attack modifier for Finnish aircraft when they attack Soviet tanks. And then they have the Irosani KM-5, and this increases the supply range of Soviet units to their headquarters from seven to nine hexes. Now, in addition to technology improvements, which are unique for each of the sides, there are three improvements that are common. Meteorology, espionage, and sabotage. So at the beginning of the game, the players start with no national military capacity being dedicated to any of these technological advancements and the players can spend military capacity to increase their chances of successfully gaining one of these advancements. 
For instance, if the player decides to go for the meteorology advancement, he has to pay one military capacity for each level on the table and then roll a die. And the minimum level that you have to achieve in order to be allowed to roll a die to see if you achieve the technology is level three. And that's the row that is in green. So let's say that the Finns spend three military capacity in order to move the marker on the meteorology track to that number three row. And for this purpose, the Finnish player spends three military capacity in the form of these money chits. And the Finns also want to have a shot at developing multi-tactics. Notice that technology improvements cost three in military capacity for each level. So let's say that the Finns want to reach level three, so that costs them nine. So the Finns spend money tokens totaling nine military capacity. Now let's say that the Finns have spent a lot in terms of uh, advancements of uh, relating to technology. So now they won't spend any more this turn. And now because they achieved level three, they can roll a die for each of the improvements. We see the chances of activating the advantage depending on the level where the marker is. We have both markers at level three, so we need a four or less. Now this is something that should be on the uh, technology uh, chart there the range or the specific number or less that you need to roll for success. Okay, so let's roll to see if we obtain any of these technologies. We start with meteorology. We need four or less, and the result is a four. So we obtain meteorology. And now we go for multi-tactics, and we also need four or less, and the roll is a seven, so that's a failure there but we did obtain meteorology and meteorology gives us the ability to take a look at the next uh, weather conditions for the next round and this lasts throughout the game here we see the temperature and weather condition tables and in this winter war of course both of these factors are critical and have profound effects on the game. At the beginning of the game, the temperature is set to very cold. And here we see the effects on frozen lakes. And that is that infantry only can cross. Notice that if uh, the temperature would be at icy, infantry and artillery can cross. But at the beginning of the game, it is at very cold. As to weather conditions at the beginning of the game, it is clear that is no effect. But notice the possibilities of rain, uh, which creates muddy terrain, costs one more movement point. You have snow, where air unit movement is reduced by four hexes, and fog, which causes that ground unit movement is reduced by one movement point, and air units simply cannot play they cannot move or fight now because the Finns achieve the meteorology advancement they get to learn the weather conditions for the next round and for that they would roll a die to determine temperature and then weather conditions and keep it secret until the next turn so we roll first for temperature and we roll 1d10 and here you see the possible results marker can move to the left, which means that temperature drops, or to the right, that it increases, or it stays the same. So let's say that the roll is a five, in which case the temperature drops, and we move the marker one column to the left. In this case, it is now icy temperature. The temperature has an impact on the weather conditions. So now we are going to roll for weather conditions. And for that, we use the 1D12. So we roll the 1D12 that is included with the game. And the roll is an eight. Rain slash snow. And this depends, of course, 
on the temperature. Rain is possible only when cold and cool, but it is icy. So that means that the weather conditions will be snow because it is icy and this means that air unit movement is reduced by four hexes. Let's take a look at the other advancements here. Espionage allows the player to reroll their or their opponent's die if they don't like the result and it costs three in military capacity and after using it you have to restart the process so you have to uh, dedicate points to the uh, uh, chart here and roll to see if you get it again. There's also sabotage in which the enemy unit with the sabotage marker that has it can't play on their turn. They can't move, they cannot fight. It costs three military capacity and again after it is used the player has to restart the process by dedicating military capacity and rolling on the chart. And then of course we have the technological improvements that we already saw for the Finns. We talked about certain advantages that Finnish infantry had. There are advantages that can come as a result of random events in this game. Now, random events in this game come in the form of calendar cards. What are calendar cards? These are cards that are placed in a certain order based on the round to which they apply. You see that these three cards have the Roman numeral one. These are the calendar cards for round one, for the first, let's say, turn in the game. At the beginning of the game, the players secretly and randomly choose one card for each of the rounds. So let's say they choose this one for round one. So when round one is about to begin, we flip that card and we determine the event. This one is the Soviets reach the Mannerheim line. And you see historical background to the event's effect. And here it is that the fortification hexes now cost four movement points to enter instead of three. So this is gonna make the Finns pay one more movement point if they want to place units in fortification hexes. Now, this could have been the card, but also this could have been the card instead. Bombing of Helsinki, which would give the Soviets a plus one attack modifier for air units when attacking a city hex. So notice these are pro-Soviet events because the war is starting and the Soviets have all the advantages. And here we see the Soviets took Petsamo, and this gives an attack modifier of plus one to Soviet infantry, but only one of these cards will be secretly selected and revealed when round one comes about. But you have cards for each and every one of the other turns. So you're never going to be certain as to what events will apply. And this of course is another circumstance that gives this game more replayability because you will never draw the same calendar cards for each game that you play. Now, at the beginning of the game, the Finns have two tank units and the Soviets have three, so they have a slight advantage in the number of tank units, but Soviet tank units have a special ability. The Soviet player can remove the tracks of his tanks and have them run on wheels. And for that, we use this marker. And the marker, to signify that a unit of tanks is running on wheels, is placed underneath the stack of strength markers, as so. And a tank running on wheels has a movement allowance of 20 movement factors instead of 14. Now, there is a downside. Tank running on wheels has its total attack and defense values halved with fractions rounded up. So this particular tank, which has a strength of 5 and an attack value of 5, normally would have a total attack value of 10, but because it is running on wheels, the total attack value is 5. And the total defense value, which is 4 for the defense value plus 5 for its strength, 9, is halved and rounded up also to five. At the beginning of the game, each of the sides has three artillery units. 
artillery units have the ability of firing at enemy ground units which are up to four hexes away as denoted by the 4H printed on their counters. Artillery units move and fight differently from infantry and armor units. And to give you an idea, let's say it's the Soviet player's turn and he is moving his units and conducting combats with the units too. In this game, all movement and combat is done individually by each unit. It is always one unit attacking another unit. So let's say that this Soviet infantry unit is moved and it is moved two hexes along a road and that would cost it four movement factors and it reaches a hex in the zone of control of this Finnish infantry unit. It has to stop and it may or may not attack, but, but it decides to attack that unit. We resolve the combat and that's the end of that round for that Soviet infantry unit. Artillery units work differently. If they move, they cannot fire, but they can fire and then move. So let's say that this particular artillery unit fires at the Finnish infantry unit in the woods hex, which is three spaces away. And let's say that it was lucky enough to eliminate one strength counter. Now the artillery unit can move and it moves two hexes towards the Russian home city there. And now, of course, the artillery unit has the protection of the zones of control of the Russian infantry units that you see here. Now let's go to the air units. At the beginning of the game, the Soviets have three fighter units as compared to the Finns two, and they have two bomber units and the Finns one. So the Soviets have a clear advantage of air units at the beginning of the game. Now, air units have to take off from airfields like the one shown here. And air units have a particular hex range. And this particular Soviet air unit has a range of 14 hexes. That means the 14 is the total range. So this particular unit, for example, could fly seven hexes away to attack a Finnish unit and then fly seven hexes back to land in a friendly airbase. Now, fighter units have an attack value of four and also a defense value of four, as shown here. Bomber units, of course, have a higher attack value, six, and a defense value of two. And in this game, there is air-to-ground combat in the way that fighters and bombers can attack ground units. And there's also air-to-air -air combat in the way that fighters can intercept enemy fighters or bombers that are attacking ground units. In this game, players set up their units secretly using these uh, sheets that come in a pad. You write, for example, an I for an infantry unit, T for a tank unit, and B for bombers, F for fighters, AA for anti-aircraft units and HQ for headquarters units. Then after both players have secretly uh, plotted where their units start, they reveal their positions and set the units on the map. We have a sample setup. We see the Soviet forces along the main front, which is to the north of Leningrad, and their objectives here are to penetrate the Mannerheim line and take those cities that you see there. That two-valued city is Vipuri. And in the final version of both maps in this game, they will have the names of the cities. And uh, we see here now the Finnish forces that are facing in the main front. And we see Finnish forces to the north that are giving up some terrain in exchange for the protection of woods. The Soviets have some air units nearby, tanks ready to advance on the roads, 
and artillery ready to bombard anything within a four hex range. The Soviets go first. So they have the burden of attack. And we see here all the Soviet forces deployed with the Finnish forces trying to defend in depth and contain the Soviets without losing many of their uh, points of military capacity. You see that the Finns have many cities with a value of two. Soviets, on the other hand, cannot leave unguarded their own cities because uh, they have to control to win at least five of their seven cities. The first turn, you can expect Soviet air units like the bomber unit you see there and here near Leningrad to be conducting bombing missions against the Finnish forces that are close to the front. But the Finns have fighters that may intercept these missions. Finns also have uh, tank units in central positions to act as reserves to plug any gaps. And they have their own bomber force, just one unit in a central position also, just in case they need some offensive punch. Now there's people that voiced some concerns about this map uh, being too colorful and uh, not very war gamey. And uh, Princeps Games will publish the game with this map. And on the back side of this mounted map board, there will be another map. And one that looks more familiar to war gamers. And uh, I only have the PDF to show you. So here is that other map. Uh, personally, I don't have any problem with this map. The only thing I uh, don't like about this map is that the lakes are too rounded. But that's a minor quibble. Uh, I can easily play on this map as well as the other map that will be available. So, I hope that this video has given you an idea of the flow of this game and what the game has to offer. Freezing Inferno. Kickstarter campaign starting October 25. And this is Stuka Joe signing off for now. Thanks for watching.